Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, our guest is Justin Lay Miller. He is a social psychologist and research fellow at the Kinsey Institute. In the interest of the show, he's also an award-winning sex educator, having been honored three times with the Certificate of Teaching Excellence from Harvard University, where he taught for several years. He has published more than 50 academic works to date, including a textbook titled The Psychology of Human Sexuality that is used in college classrooms around the world. Dr. Leigh Miller's research focuses on topics including casual sex, sex fantasy, sexual health, and friends with benefits. He runs the popular blog Sex and Psychology and hosts the Sex and Psychology podcast, which ranks among the top social science podcasts. Justin, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Holly. Thanks so much for having me here. So I love having uh, sex educators on because, you know, usually my guests are people in the adult industry who are, are wonderful and fascinating, but it's always really cool to have an episode where we get to be educated on all of these topics around sex, which is, you know, a topic that consumes most people's lives, whether or not they want to admit it. So I guess let's just start off with a little introduction about you. Can you tell us what got you interested in the field of sex education? Sure. So this is not something that I spent my whole life planning <laughs> to go into. It just kind of spontaneously happened. So my professional journey was I went and got my undergraduate degree in psychology and went to graduate school to study social psychology. And specifically, I wanted to study the psychology of romantic relationships and what makes for a healthy, long-lasting, committed relationship. And along the way in graduate school, I got assigned to be a teaching assistant for a human sexuality course. And for me, somewhere in my mid-20s, that was actually my first real real formal experience with sex education. I was someone who went to Catholic schools for much of my life growing up. I went to Catholic college for undergraduate. And so then I was at this big state university at Purdue uh, studying psychology. They had a human sexuality course on the books. I was assigned to be a teaching assistant for it. And then suddenly I had to run these weekly sections with students talking about what was going on in the course and they could ask me any questions they had about sex. And I realized I knew nothing, right? Um, I realized just how little sex education I had gotten, how little everybody else knows. And that course was really what opened my eyes to the fact that there is this whole world of sex research. People have so many questions about sex that just haven't been answered or there just isn't good data on it. And so that is what inspired me to go into the field. And something else was that, you know, I was in graduate school studying relationships, but nobody was talking about sex, which is kind of weird because sex mm. is a pretty big part of most people's relationships. So I ended up transitioning my career into becoming a sex and relationship researcher because sex usually occurs in some relationship context, whether it's casual or committed, monogamous or non-monogamous. And so that's really kind of how I got into the field. I just stumbled into it and I couldn't be happier that it happened. How long have you been doing this for? So I graduated with my PhD in 2008. So I've been out in the field since then. And it was somewhere along the way in graduate school, I think after my first year or two, that uh, I really started to get into the sex research part. And by the time I left graduate school, I taught my own sexuality course six times. And that's where I really learned so much of what I know about sex was because I had to go out and educate myself because there weren't any sex courses in our curriculum. Mm. Yeah. It's pretty crazy how sex education just like doesn't exist in this country. Um, I think, what is the statistic? Is it like sex ed is only required in what 13 States or something like that? It's um, it's a requirement in around half, of states. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but the number of states that require medically accurate sex ed, yeah, it's somewhere around 13 or 14. Um, so, you know, there are some states that require sex ed, but it's like, we don't care what the hell you <laughs> teach people about, just, you know, teach them something about sex. We don't care if it's useful or accurate or not. What, what do you find that people are teaching people about sex in those situations? Is that, is that a course where you might get taught about abstinence, like taught that abstinence is the only 
real method of, say, birth control? Yeah, those are often the just say no courses when it comes mm. to sex, where that's really the only thing they do is a bunch of scare tactics. Like, here's all the bad things that are going to happen if you have sex, you're going to get pregnant and die. And um, they don't teach people. You're going to get pregnant to... and die. <laughs> yes. Both. Like, it, both are inevitable if you have sex. You know, that, that really is kind of the message that so many of those abstinence courses teach. And it's problematic that we don't give adolescents a lot of useful information about sex. We don't give them comp comprehensive sex ed for the most part. But we also don't do this at other stages of life doctors and physicians, people who are going to become sex therapists, there's so little sexuality training for all of them. And so a lot of us in the field have to be like me and that you're self-taught. You have to go out and do the work yourself and find the learning opportunities because no one is out there really providing it. And that's part of the reason why after spending 10 years as a full-time academic, I transitioned into full-time science communication. So I run a blog and a podcast and I write books and I uh, find other ways of taking the science and research that's out there and helping get it in the hands of people who need to know it and can use it to improve and enhance their sex lives and mm -hmm. relationships. So you mentioned books. Um, let's talk about your latest book, which is Tell Me What You Want, The Science of Sexual Desire and How It Can Improve Your Sex Life. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, what you actually cover in this book? That was a book that was about four years in the making. It was a pretty ambitious book project because I wanted to write a book about the largest and most comprehensive scientific survey of sexual fantasies ever undertaken in the United States. So I spent a couple of years going out and surveying more than 4,000 Americans from all 50 states about their favorite fantasy of all time, as well as hundreds of people, places, and things they might have ever fantasized about. And then I wrote this book looking at not just what are we fantasizing about, but what do our fantasies say about us? So how do your fantasies connect to your personality, your sexual history, your demographic background? Uh, I also look at what's the connection between fantasy and reality? So how many people want to act on their sexual fantasies and how many have actually done so? And what are their experiences like? And what can we learn from them in terms of providing helpful tools to people who might want to incorporate more of their fantasies into their intimate lives? I'm glad you brought that up because I have found that, you know, through talking to so many people um, through this podcast and just in my own experiences that, you know, a lot of people are really ashamed about their fantasies and they're afraid to talk about them because they think it might point to some kind of inner psychological problem. You know, there's a lot of people who have like dark fantasies and, and they're afraid, what does that say about me as a person? Um, what have you found when you talk to people about fan their fantasies and ones that might possibly trouble them? I find that those feelings of shame and guilt and embarrassment are extraordinarily common. Some people are more likely to experience them than others, though. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting about my data was that men, compared to women, actually reported feeling more shame and guilt about their sexual mm -hmm. fantasies. And that was interesting because, you know, we talk a lot about the sexual double standard and how women are judged more harshly for their sexuality and their sexual behaviors compared to men, but men were actually harboring more feelings of guilt and shame. Now, certainly women have a lot of those feelings as well. But what I find is that the more people feel guilt and shame, the less likely they are to engage with their fantasy content. So they run from it. They try to suppress those thoughts sometimes because they're uncomfortable. And they also don't share them with their partners or incorporate them into their sex lives. And the end result is that they experience more psychological distress, more sexual difficulties when it comes to performance and arousal. And they also have more relationship problems, more sexual communication issues and conflict in the relationship because they're not really getting what they want when it comes to sex because they don't feel like they can even talk about it. So the people who are doing the best, I find in my work, are the people who have accepted their fantasies for what they are, the people who engage with them and who are willing to open up about them with their partners and maybe even act on some of them. That's really interesting, uh, the idea that men experience more shame around their sexual fantasies. Wh why do you think that is? 
part of the reason for it is because men have more taboo sexual fantasies on average mm-hmm. than women do. And so men might be more likely to fantasize about the things that are likely to provoke those feelings of shame and guilt. So I think that's part of the explanation uh, that, that's going on there is that the things that turn men on more often than women are things that are more often stigmatized in society. Could you ever have a sexual fantasy that's just straight up wrong? It's a good question. And here's what I would say to that. It's normal in the sense that it's really common for people to have a dark, very deviant sexual fantasy that pops into their head. Something, for example, that might be non-consensual or that might be very risky or harmful if they were to actually act that out in the real world. So it's normal if you've had a thought like that pop into your head before. And it's not a sign that there's something wrong with you. And it's not a sign necessarily that you're going to commit a sex crime or anything like that. Where fantasies become problems is when you have those types of fantasies, those really dark fantasies on a recurring basis. It's your go-to thing that turns you on. And you also have a desire to act on it. And you have concern Mm -hmm. that you might act it out and then perform this fantasy in reality in a way that would be very harmful to you or to someone else. So I don't really characterize the fantasies themselves as harmful. It's when the fantasy is non-consensual or very risky, and that's coupled with this desire to act on it. And that's where we need to help people to prevent them from doing things that are going to get them in trouble or really cause serious harm or injury uh, to someone else. Right. Yeah, I myself um, have had some pretty dark fantasies over the years, um, and I find that I have no desire to reenact them whatsoever. Like I had, like I've had this. Well, actually, this isn't even a really dark desire. This is something that I've shot myself. But um, I used to have a lot of like gangbang fantasies, and um, I, if you put a bunch of guys in a room with me and they all like got naked and we're like, I'm going to have sex with you. I'd be like, absolutely fucking not. (laughs) Like the idea of actually engaging in that fantasy in real life to me is I'm so not into it. Um, my fantasies really very much reside in my head and I don't have any desire to act them out, but just, but you know, there is this stigma, like you said, that just having the idea of the fantasy is wrong. And, uh, one common fantasy among women that I know a lot of women have, and a lot of people hate to hear this. And I've discussed this on my podcast with other, um, sex therapists is, uh, the rape fantasy for women. And, um, you know, the idea that a woman, you know, women don't, nobody wants to be raped, but women have these rape fantasies. And this is super common. Why do you think that that occurs. And what does that mean? So I do find in my work that these so-called rape fantasies, and I I don't like that term. Um, I tend to use the term forced sex fantasy or consensual non-consent fantasy because the types of fantasies we're talking about here really have no resemblance to a real world sexual assault. Because when you think Mm. about these fantasies, the person who is having that fantasy is in control. They get to select who their partner or partners are, the terms and conditions under which the encounter takes place, when it starts, when it ends. And so when you're the fantasizer, you're in control. And it is consensual, even if what you're fantasizing about is forced sex, right? Um, Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for us to reframe our conversations around these fantasies. And I think taking that rape term out of it is, is kind of a helpful first step. And something that I think a lot of people will find to be interesting is that it's not just women who have these fantasies. I find that a majority of self-identified men, a majority of people who identify as gender non-binary report having these fantasies about sex being forced on them. Now, women are more likely to have these fantasies than men are, but most men have had that fantasy before too. And so it's not something that's unique to any one gender. And I think part of it speaks to the fact that submission, sexual submission in general, is a really common sexual fantasy. And coupled with that is this desire 
to be overwhelmingly desired by someone else. And I think that's why these fantasies are also sometimes called ravishment fantasies. It's because you want a partner or partners who find you so irresistible that they can't help themselves or control themselves. And so I think these fantasies speak to deeper desires for things like submission and for feeling wanted and feeling irresistible more than anything else. And so we need to totally separate and distance this from, you know, discussions about rape and sexual assault in the real world, because that is a totally different and abhorrent thing. Whereas these fantasies are things that have totally different roots and are unrelated. Yeah, I'm glad that you made that distinction. Um, The consent, non-consent, or CNC, as I've seen it abbreviated online, is something that has come up a lot lately, especially with the New York Times article about um, Pornhub, and you know they they claimed that it was raped. It was raped. Sorry, that it was infested with rape videos, where a lot of people argued these are consent, non-consent videos that performers willingly engage in, and this falls under um, the First Amendment. You know, people are allowed to make this kind of content as long as obviously the adults are consenting adults and they're acting out of fantasy and it is not true to life. And um, there's a lot of people that have a really hard time wrapping their head around the idea that maybe a CNC fantasy could be a situation where, um, could could it be a place for healing? Like I've talked to some performers who said that they like to engage in these kinds of scenes because like you mentioned before, it allows them to take control over a situation that perhaps they had a traumatic experience with in their past, but reliving it in a controlled, safe environment helps them process that experience. Is that something that you've come across? So I have seen something along those lines in the sense that for many people, their fantasies are therapeutic in a sense Mm -hmm. where they are working through some previous trauma that they've endured. And so sometimes in our fantasies, we put ourselves in positions or we craft scenarios that give us this sense of control that maybe we felt we were lacking at a previous point in life or during a previous experience. So there is something to that idea. But when it comes to actually acting out these consensual non-consent or forced sex fantasies, I find that there's actually a lot of concern among my participants about doing that. So while these are extraordinarily common fantasies, a lot of people say, you know, the idea of this is arousing to me, but I don't actually want to act on it because if I do, I have to give up some degree of control to the other person, or I have to place a lot of trust in someone else in order to carry this out. And I'm just not really comfortable with that. So I think we always need to make the distinction between sexual fantasy and sexual desire. And sometimes a fantasy is just a fantasy. It's a thought that turns you on. Maybe you turn to that thought during masturbation or during partnered sex, but you have no desire to actually incorporate it in your real life for a wide range of reasons. One being that maybe you think it's too risky to act on, or you don't think you could trust another partner enough to get that fantasy in a way that would, or to act on that fantasy in a way that would make you feel comfortable and at ease. Would it be okay then for you to consume CNC porn scenes? So I think that's something that different people need to decide for themselves because when it comes to pornography, that's a little bit different because that is often the embodiment of fantasy. And sometimes by making the porn and watching the porn, it feels more real than just the Mm -hmm. fantasy. And I think that's where a lot of the discomfort comes from, uh, is that, you know, there are a lot of people who have these CNC fantasies, but they don't even want to watch the porn because that just feels a step too far or it feels too real. And I think that's That's especially common now in this Me Too era that we're in, where we're rethinking a lot of our sexual fantasies and desires and urges and so forth. And I've actually heard from a lot of women who have four sex fantasies who suddenly find themselves really uncomfortable with having these fantasies because they want to support women who are victims of sexual violence and sex trafficking and um, 
and they want to believe the women, help them, support them. And they feel that somehow they are traitors to the cause by having this fantasy or by watching this type of porn. Um, and, and sometimes with the porn, you know, you don't see all the negotiation and all the other things that goes on beforehand when a scene is filmed. And so I think, again, that's part of the discomfort because people are already mm. feeling a lot of ambivalence about these fantasies. And then when you add in the porn, which makes it feel somewhat more ambiguous because it's this actual embodiment of the fantasy, I, I think that is what provokes a lot of discomfort. So I think we need to step back and different people are going to have very different feelings about that. Yeah. I had one of my Patreon members who asked, you know, in light of everything that's going on with Pornhub and the New York Times article and um, all the CNC videos that uh, were taken down off of the website, that, you know, why don't we put up some kind of disclaimer at the beginning saying, like, this was between consenting adults, like, nobody was harmed in this, or having a mini interview at the beginning to kind of assure the viewer that it is a fantasy between consenting adults and it's not real. Um, I do know that certain BDSM companies actually do pre and post interviews. Kink is a wonderful example. And I always find that I turn to the BDSM world when we're talking about consent and we're talking about acting out extreme fantasies in a safe place. And I, and I do feel like the mainstream or vanilla porn world could learn so much from the way that people in the BDSM community um, manage consent and manage boundaries. Yeah, I think it's absolutely true. And I, I think there is room for improvement in the way that pornography is presented and increasing that transparency or visibility and, and helping people to better understand, you know, the difference between porn sex and real sex and how there's all of these things that happen off screen, especially a lot of negotiation and consent communication. And when people are looking at porn as a model for sex education, which a lot of people are because they're not getting sex at anywhere else, we can see how there's the potential for them to take problematic messages away from that. And I think that ultimately goes back to the need for more porn literacy education, but also maybe it's incumbent upon the porn companies and distributors to think about what are other ways that we can really clearly communicate that consent happened here and, and occurred. And so, you know, having those pre and post interviews, you know, could be one way of putting some people's mind at ease. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I definitely think there's a lot of room for improvement in that area. Um, let's talk about some other fantasies uh, that might be a little bit more palatable what is actually the most common fantasy that you come across when you're talking to people about, you know, their sex, innermost sexual desires? Well, there's a lot. So it turns out that most people have a pretty diverse fantasy repertoire and they're not just fantasizing about one thing. But when I ask people, what is your favorite fantasy of all time? I asked my participants to write this out in as many words as they wanted. And some people wrote pages because their fantasies are very detailed and elaborate. But I also asked them to sum up their favorite fantasy of all time into a single word. And so looking at those single word descriptions was really revealing because this is what that individual sees as the primary theme that characterizes their favorite fantasy. And by far, the word, the single word that was mentioned more than any other word was threesome. Uh, more than a third of my participants said, you know, you can sum up my favorite fantasy of all time as being a threesome. And it turns out that more than 90% of men and women and non-binary individuals as well say that they've fantasized about a threesome before or um, another form of group sex. Uh, so I find that multi-partner activities are one of the most common sexual fantasies, but also BDSM activities rank right up there as well with the vast majority of people across identities uh, for gender and sexual orientation, saying they fantasized about different aspects of BDSM. But I do find that masochistic and submissive fantasies are much more common than sadistic and, and dominant fantasies. So it seems that there's more desire for people to give up control and to have pain inflicted on them rather than taking control and inflicting pain on somebody else. Interesting. Why do you think that is? Well, <laughs> I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that, 
you know, when you're talking about power dynamics and power exchange in sex, there's a lot of responsibility in being mm-hmm. the one with the power, the one taking on the dominant role. And I think for some people that's intimidating and, you know, might make them a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, it can also be stressful to, you know, feel like you have to take the initiative. For example, I find that, you know, sexual initiation is often a, a big part of this power dynamic is that, you know, who is is starting the event and who is directing it. I think a lot of people just feel more comfortable kind of giving up control to their partner. But because we see that being more common in general, that's part of the reason why we have a lot of desire discrepancies and other issues in relationships. It's because neither partner is initiating and you kind of need to take (laughs) turns, you know, taking on those different roles in the relationship because if both partners are uncomfortable with just even basic sexual initiation, then when is sex actually going to happen? Yeah. God, that's so true. All right. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Hang tight and we'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, we are back. So we briefly touched upon the fantasy of threesomes, and this is something that a lot of people are interested in trying out. I myself have had two threesomes in my life. Um, Neither one turned out the way that I expected it to. So what is... What is the fantasy versus the reality usually like when it comes to threesomes? And if I was somebody who wanted to suggest to my partner about engaging in a threesome, what's the best way to go about it? And what are the most common pitfalls? It's a great question. So to step back for a second, when I ask people about their favorite fantasy of all time, I also ask them, have you ever shared this fantasy with a partner? Have you ever acted on it? Do you want to act on it? as well. And what I find is that about 80% of my participants say that they want to act on their favorite fantasy, no matter what it is, but only about half of them say they've ever shared that fantasy, and only about one in five have ever actually acted on it. So there's a pretty big gap between fantasy and reality with people carrying around a lot of fantasies that they do want to act on, but have never yet found an opportunity or the confidence or opportunity uh, to do so. So when it comes to threesome fantasies specifically, I find that that really does seem to be the single most common fantasy, but it's also the fantasy that is least likely to turn out well when people act on it. And I think a big part of the reason for that is because most people don't really have a script for how that should go, right? They understand the dynamics of two-person sex, but what happens when you bring another person into the bedroom? Who does what with whom and when? And how do you navigate that, figure it out? How do you ensure that nobody feels left out, that everybody's getting their needs met? And so I think it's oftentimes that uncertainty that is a big problem in threesomes and group encounters, but it's also often having these like really sky high expectations that are different 
across different partners where they've envisioned the scenario going different ways. And when I look at the ways that, that people describe their threesome fantasies, most people fantasize about being the center of attention. Well, if everybody's fantasizing about being the center of attention, you know, that's sort of a recipe for disaster when you can go in because, you know, people aren't feeling like they're getting what they want. And so I think it's really important to understand when it comes to threesomes that they require a lot of advanced communication and communication during the act to figure out what it is that people want so that everybody leaves that situation feeling like they got their needs met and feel satisfied. I think more often than not, people kind of like jump into threesomes without having that advanced discussion or negotiation. And that's where things often tend to go wrong, where it just kind of, it's a threesome that happens spontaneously rather than having it being planned um, and negotiated where you can actually figure those things out. So communication is really one of the big keys. Yeah. And both of my threesome experiences, there was always someone being left out. One of them was me. And then the other time was the girl's boyfriend who she brought into the scenario. I was not interested in it, but I was like, okay, whatever, fine. Suck his dick if you really want me to. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was definitely no communication in either one of those. So speaking of communication, if I was in a relationship and I wanted to suggest to my partner the idea of a threesome, what's the best way to go about that? And how do I avoid any issues of jealousy or perhaps my partner questioning whether or not I really want to be in a monogamous relationship? It's a great question. And I get asked this all the time about a range of fantasies. How do I share this fantasy? You know, for example, I get a lot of men who write me through my website and say, I really want to watch my wife or girlfriend sleep with other men. How do I make this happen? And so, you know, my advice first, just kind of regardless of what your fantasy is, is to make sure that you have really solid sexual communication in your relationship. And if you've never shared fantasies before, it's probably best to step back and start low and go slow. Start by sharing some of your tamer sexual fantasies and identifying some of your common sexual interests before you jump into the more adventurous things or things that involve bringing other people into the bedroom. Because you really need to build up that trust and intimacy and communication to have really successful encounters where you take fantasy and turn it into reality. Uh, so that's a big part of it. Another part is when you're sharing a fantasy with a partner to present it in a way that validates them. Because a lot of people feel threatened when their partner shares a fantasy with them because they think that it means that you're dissatisfied and that there's something wrong with them or with the relationship. And it doesn't matter. This fantasy can be about anything. It doesn't have to be a group thing. It could be a passion and romance fantasy. And there are some people who will find that to be threatening because they take it personally. So I think it's really important mm -hmm. when you're sharing a fantasy to validate your partner. Tell them how hot and sexy and attractive you think they are and how you love the sex that you're having and how you, know, you had this idea for this thing that you could try together. And here's what both of us can get out of it rather than presenting it as like, hey, I want to have a threesome, you know, and making it sound like this is just for you rather than something that's that's for them. So, you know, that communication, that validation piece, uh, I think is really important. And also choosing the right timing. Like, when do you share yeah. your sexual fantasies? So, you know, try to do it at a moment when you're already both sexually aroused because sexual arousal tends to reduce your disgust response. And so it's more likely that you'll be receptive to each other's fantasies if you can do this in a moment when you're both kind of in the mood rather than, you know, over the breakfast table or, you know, spontaneously at some other point during the day. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. So you mentioned that one common fantasy among men is watching their partner with another man. Uh, that's a niche in the adult industry, which is very popular, which we call cuckolding. And oftentimes in porn, that's portrayed in a very aggressive way where the wife is having sex with some guy who's much bigger and manlier than her husband. And she's kind of berating her husband the whole time saying, you know, this guy's dick is so much bigger than yours and he can make me come in a way you can't. Basically, it's like a humiliating cuckolding scene. But I actually have this really interesting 
member of my OnlyFans who is really into cuckolding, but he and I have had discussions about how he sees it in an entirely different way. He loves it because it's the idea that like his partner is so sexy and so beautiful and so irresistible that he wants to like share her with other men and he wants to see other men worship her in the way that he believes her, uh, she should be worshiped in the way that he worships her. And for him, it's almost like a validating, mm-hmm. um, situation. So how does that fit into the cuckolding fantasies that you've heard about from your patients? Yeah. So cuckolding just in general is a super common fantasy among men. I find that more than half of people who identify as male across sexual orientations say they've fantasized about some type of cuckolding before where they're watching their partner have sex with someone else. Now, Mm -hmm. I've done some specific studies of cuckolding and cuckolding fantasies, and I find that they play out in different ways for different men. And sometimes there are different terms that people use to describe those fantasies. So the term cuckolding often connotes this, you know, BDSM connection where the person who is watching, who is taking on that voyeuristic role, is also submissive and might have elements of masochism and humiliation involved, right? Um, But there are some people who are interested in this, you know, same basic idea of watching their partner have sex with someone else, but there's no BDSM element to it at all. And it might be along the lines of what you said, where there's that positive reflection on the self where it's an ego boost in a way. Um, but it might also be seeing their partner's pleasure. That is what is the turn on for them where it's, it's sort of this idea of compersion where you take pleasure in your partner's pleasure. Now the term hot wifing is something that's often used to refer to that kind of variant of cuckolding where you're getting that esteem or ego boost. And a colleague of mine, uh, David Lay, he's a sex therapist and New Mexico has written a great book that dives into cuckolding and hot wifing and the distinctions between them. And it's called Insatiable Wives, Women Who Stray and the Men Who Love Them. So it's a great read if you're interested in learning more about kind of the dynamics of cuckolding, which, you know, it, it's super fascinating. There are other elements we could get into. We could do like a whole show just on that because, you know, there's often this interracial component that goes along with cuckolding. Um, there's this big emphasis on penis size uh, of the third person coming in as well. So it's, it, you know, again, we could talk a lot about that, but I encourage you to check out David's book to, to learn more about that. And if you guys haven't already seen it, you can also check out my interview with Dr. Lay. I did interview him about a year, two years ago. Um, just look back in the archives and um, you can find my episode with him. And we talked a little bit about his book as well. Um, but we talked what we talked a lot about and something that I want to ask you too is about the idea of porn addiction. Is it a myth? Is it true? Um, if you have issues with watching too much porn, it's affecting your personal life. How do you address that? We're going to get to that right after this commercial break. So hang tight, guys. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. Use code HOLLY to get 10 free gifts plus free shipping with any purchase. That's adameve.com. Use code HOLLY for 10 free gifts plus free shipping. All right, everybody, welcome back. So I want to dive right into the issue of porn addiction. And is it a real addiction? It's something that I've had a lot of people ask me about. And um, I know that there's quite a few people that I've spoken to who have said that it's had a negative impact on their life. So how would you address those questions? So I think when we're talking about pornography and the way that it affects people, what we see in the research is that it affects different people in different ways. For the vast majority of people, porn does not cause problems. And for many of them, porn enhances and improves their sex life in various ways. Uh, So for example, porn is a way that people can vicariously live out some of their sexual fantasies or where they can get inspiration for new fantasies or it's an aid for sexual arousal. 
We also see in research on couples that couples who use porn together as a form of sexual novelty, a way of you know, adding a dose of newness or excitement to their relationship, they're more sexually satisfied and they're more likely to report keeping passion alive in their relationship. And so we actually see a lot of positive effects of porn on people. And for most people, that seems to be the more likely way that it affects them. Now, by the same token, there are some people who say that porn is a negative influence in their life and it causes problems. So, for example, some people who say they have problems controlling their porn use, they feel like it's out of control for them, or it's become a source of disagreement or conflict in their relationship. I hear about that one quite a bit. And I think the interesting question to analyze there is whether porn itself is really the problem or whether it's something else, you know, where porn is a symptom of another problem or issue. And I think when we're talking about the people who, you know, feel very uncomfortable with their porn use and who feel like they might be addicted to it or that their porn use is out of control, what we often see in the research is that they've got other issues going on in their life where maybe there's some depression or anxiety that leads them to seek out more pornography, or they've got a major issue in their relationship. It's maybe a sexless relationship, and so they've turned to porn as a substitute uh, for the sex that they're not having. Uh, or, you know, what might upset them is that they're using pornography, but they feel that they shouldn't be doing that because they have moral qualms about it. And so sometimes there's this moral conflict that's going on. And so I think that's where it can be helpful to work with a sex therapist to figure out, you know, what is actually going on here? And is porn really the problem or is it one of these other things that we have been talking about? So I think our tendency is to demonize porn, say it's bad and addictive and causes all of these problems. But when I look at the research, what I see is that, you know, there's this complex nuanced story and that more often than not, it doesn't seem to be the case that porn itself is inherently the problem. There's usually something else that, that's going along with it that needs to be addressed. And so what that means is that if our solution is just to tell people don't watch porn or, um, you know, ban porn or something like that, that that isn't addressing the actual issue. And, you know, it's just a, a band-aid rather than providing them with comprehensive medical treatment. That's, that's definitely along the lines of what, uh, Dr. David Lay said as well. Um, that, you know, a lot of times it was tangled up in these, these uh, feelings of shame just around sex in general and having, you know, a religious background conflict and all that kind of thing. So and just one other thing I could add to that really quickly yeah. is that in a lot of the studies where people who feel like their porn use is out of control are asked, well, how much time do you actually spend watching porn? It's measured in minutes per week. You know, in one study, it was about 15 minutes of porn use per week was the average for people who felt that they were addicted to porn. And it's like, well, you know, the average American watches, what, two to three hours of television per day. We don't call that an addiction, but we're going to call 15 minutes of porn use in a week an addiction. And I think that that speaks to the underlying conflict and shame that is often at the root of these issues for people who feel like they're addicted to porn. And so again, that's just where I think working with a certified sex therapist could be really helpful and useful in unpacking what the actual issue is and whether it's porn or something else. Wow. God, can you imagine if we actually like looked at social media as a serious addiction? Because I mean, <laughs> that is something that I think almost all of us can say we spend way too much time on. Yep. That's really interesting. 15 minutes a week of porn is considered many people. Well, consider and so this is people who are self-identifying as an addict. Right. right? No. Right. And, and you know, that's an average. There's a range. There are some people who are right. using it hours a day. Right. And that's a you right. know different matter. But I think it's fascinating that there can be people who are using porn for, you know, an average of two minutes a day who feel like that's an out of control behavior. And in those cases, I think that's more likely to represent a conflict. Now, if somebody's doing it hours a day and they're doing it even when they're not feeling sexually aroused, like that might be a different issue entirely. And again, working with a sex therapist can help disentangle that. Fantastic. Um, I want to ask you about, well, I want to ask you what the most common question that you get from men 
uh, around um, sex and sexual health. And then I also want to ask you, I, my guess is, and I guess I could be absolutely way off. I'm just basing it on the experience of the question that I get asked the most, which is, does penis size really matter? Is that something that you see is a major concern among men that you've spoken to in your research? Yeah, I'd say the most common questions I get are, what is the average penis size? Does penis size matter? And are my fantasies normal? You know, those are the the kinds of things I tend to hear from men the most often. And so, yeah, there does seem to be a lot of anxiety that guys today still have that's measured in terms of how they think about their their penises. And, you know, when I ask people what they think the average penis size is, they think it's much bigger than what the actual average is. So if you look at a meta-analysis of studies of measurements of more than 15,000 men's penises, you know, the average is about five inches. You know, and when you ask people, what's the average penis size? You hear six inches, six and a half, seven inches. And it's like, no, like that's way off. And so I think a big part of what I end up doing is providing a lot of psychoeducation where it's saying, hey, here's what the actual data and statistics are. And odds are you're normal, right? And when it comes to that issue of penis size and doesn't matter, well, it doesn't matter as much as you think that it does. Um, and, you know, there are some women, some gay men who say that, you know, penis size really does matter to them and bigger is better. But uh, for a majority, at least, of heterosexually identified women, they say penis size doesn't really matter all that much in terms of their odds of reaching orgasm because most women don't orgasm through penetration alone. So I think we just place too much emphasis on the role of the penis and assuming that bigger is better. And that's not the case. I'm so glad that you pointed that out, that most women don't come from penetration alone, because I think that that's a huge misconception. I myself actually cannot come from penetration by itself whatsoever, never have in my life and never will. And I am actually not a fan of very large penises. I find that they are uncomfortable and they hurt. And, um, I can't have sex with somebody for too long if their penis is too big. So, uh, thank you for bringing that up because that is a question that I get from men all the time. And my answer is just always like your penis is probably more than adequate. And I think it's so So, true. Um, you know, it's also the case that a lot of people might think that, a bigger penis would bring them more pleasure because they see pornography and the way big penises are celebrated. And it looks like the people are having a pretty good time <laughs> in porn. And so they think that that's what it would be like for them. But then they actually get into that situation and it's like, ah, my eyes were bigger than my hole. And so it just doesn't <laughs> um, work out the way that they thought it was going to, or it doesn't feel the way that they thought that it would. And so, you know, again, that's where we need to have the porn literacy and think about like, you know, what you're seeing on screen might not reflect the reality of how your body would react if you were in a similar sexual situation. Yeah. I've actually had a couple of male porn stars on who have talked about that. Sometimes it's, it's not a good thing to have an incredibly big penis because they've unveiled it in front of a, you know, civilian, um, sexual partner, somebody not in the porn industry and the girls, you know, kind of backed off, like get that thing away from me. There's no way. So there's definitely, um, a downside to having a really big penis for sure. And the idea, okay. So this is another thing that I've had to tell people. There's a re there's a real logistical reason why penis sizes are so big in porn. First of all, porn is over the top. Porn is playing out of fantasy. Porn is not real. You know, women's tits are huge. Women's butts are big. Like this is not real life, right? So there's that. It's kind of like a characterization of, um, of real sex. Secondly, you actually need like a very long penis in order to show the penetration and be able to light and photograph it at the same time. So if you're shooting a shot where a guy's penis is going inside a woman and the guy already has to kind of have sex sideways anyways, we call it opening up the camera so that we can see the penetration. Your penis has to be quite long so that we can see the length of the penis and we can see the penetration and there's enough space between the two bodies to be able to actually photograph it and also get some light in there. So that's like a big reason 
why guys with big dicks are so much easier to shoot in porn, just simply for photographic reasons. But I, I definitely do not believe that it is an important part of being a good sexual partner. So thank you for helping me send that message out to men, because I know that that's a big concern for a lot of them. And, you know, just one other thing I'd add to that. I did um, an episode of uh, Zachary Zane. He's a sex writer at Men's Health of his show a couple of months ago. And we were talking about this issue of penis size. And he mentioned this term that I think is, you know, helpful for another way of thinking about this, which is that there's sort of this idea of vacation dick and boyfriend dick. Right. And there are some people who think, you know, a big penis like on occasion might be great, but I don't want that every day. My body couldn't handle that. I wouldn't enjoy that. And so I want somebody with a appropriate size penis for my body for my boyfriend or partner. Right. And so that's just I, I just like that <laughs> distinction as another way of thinking about this, that, you know, for a lot of people, you know, big penis might be okay on occasion, but not on a daily basis. Vacation penis. Oh my God. <laughs> That's, the, or was it vacation dick? Yeah. Which one was it? <laughs> vacation dick. Yeah. That's not, that rolls off the tongue a little bit better. I like that. That's, that's fucking great. I'm going to use that. I'm going to steal that from you. <laughs> okay. So my last question for you is uh, you often talk about myths and misconceptions that actively harm our sexual health. Um, what is one of the most common myths that you find yourself having to dispel? Oh, there's so many. I mean, the penis size thing is one of them. Um, I think one of the myths that I like to talk about that I never get tired of talking about is this idea that passion is everlasting in a relationship or that it's supposed to be everlasting if you're in a really good relationship. The reality is that it takes work to keep passion alive and it's normal for it to decrease or decline over time because human beings are inherently turned on by novelty. We need new and exciting elements in our sex lives to keep us aroused and to keep enjoying a satisfying sex life. And we see this in all kinds of studies. For example, if people watch the same porn clip every day for a week and they have their genital arousal measured each time they watch it, their arousal goes down. But if you show them a new clip with new performers, new activities taking place, then their arousal goes back up. And that just speaks to that fact that human beings are titillated by sexual novelty. And so what this means is that if you're in a long-term relationship with someone, you need to keep mixing it up and trying new things in the bedroom if you want to keep that passion alive. Um, one other big myth that I think is true for uh, sexual relationships and romantic relationships is a lot of people believe in this idea of a soulmate, which I think is bullshit, uh, to be perfectly honest, um, where they think that there's one right person out there and that when they meet that person, like everything's going to work out perfectly, like people who believe in what we call destiny. And what we see is that the reality is they actually have a harder time finding a satisfying relationship. They break up sooner and their relationships sooner because they never actually sit there and try and work on conflicts, sexual or otherwise, in the relationship. Mm -hmm. They just jump ship and leave. And so they never develop communication skills and everything else that's necessary to build that satisfying relationship they want. So uh, I would say that those are two of the, the biggest myths that I encounter. So, you know, ditch the idea <laughs> of the soulmate for one um, and, you know, make sure that you've got that, uh, you know, really solid communication in your relationship. God, that is so true. And, you know, I know that people love to like blame porn for people's relationship issues, but when you're specifically talking about that whole soulmate idea and the idea that like passion is everlasting, I blame Hollywood for that. I blame like those Disney movies, you know, um, where you're going to have this prince who's going to come and save you and he's going to be everything to you. And it's so incredibly true. I have found myself in a much happier place in my old age because I have learned to manage my expectations. And I really feel that that is like one of the true keys to happiness because when we, you talk about the idea of a soulmate, you look at this, you, you put everything on one person. I had this conversation with Tristan Terramino on an earlier episode. And when we were talking about polyamory, 
and how, you know, we have this idea that our mate has to be everything to us. He has to, you know, intellectually fulfill us and he's got to be able to sexually fulfill us on every level. And he's got to be able to emotionally fulfill us on every level. And it's just too much to expect from one person. And you're right. You know, when, when people don't meet all, tick all of those boxes that you think that, that they should, then, you know, the, we leave and then you end up, um, you know, cycling through a ton of partners or in the end, maybe up with, end up with nobody. And it's just a really sad state. So I do think that we need to reframe our idea of like what relationships are like and, you know, what a soulmate is or get rid of the idea around that altogether. Yeah. Another way I like to frame it is that your soulmate is the person who motivates you to work on your relationship because all good relationships mm -hmm. require work and effort to keep an active and satisfying sex life and to, you know, have an overall satisfying relationship. So, you know, the good relationships are not the ones that just like work out easy. They're the ones where we're motivated and invested to work and grow together with our partners. Could we also maybe consider the fact that a healthy sex life is different for different people? You know, so often I see this, this thing where like, oh, you know, people are like, oh, we have this amazing sex life. We have sex three times a week and we've been married for 50 years. And, you know, one might see that and think, oh, well, I don't have sex three times a week and I've only been married for three years. Does that mean that my marriage is already doomed? Like, could we perhaps suggest that maybe you, you have sex with less frequently than other people, but you're still like, and maybe sex isn't like a huge centerpiece of your relationship, but you're still very much in love and you're still very happy in your relationship and, and sex doesn't need to be such like a big part of what defines you as a couple. Yeah. And I think part of being a sex positive sexuality educator and professional means recognizing that different things work for different people. And for example, when it comes to a relationship, monogamy is right for some people, polyamory or swinging is right for other people. When it comes to sexual frequency, once a week or once a month or even once a year, you know, that, that can be normal if you're happy and satisfied with what's going on in your sex life. And so there isn't one right or correct sexual frequency. There isn't one right or correct way to have a sexual relationship with somebody else. You have to figure out what it is that works for you. And I think as long as the partners involved are communicating and having their needs met, then great. And we need to stop this tendency to just compare ourselves to other people and think that, well, they're having more or different, and that's necessarily better than what I'm having. And that's not the case. The question is, are you happy? Are you content? Not how are you measuring or stacking up compared to your neighbors? Yeah, the whole um, pitfall of comparing yourself to other people. That is uh, definitely a whole, a lot of us, a lot of us have uh, fallen into, and it's it's not a healthy way to live your life. Which, unfortunately, it's easier said than done because it's, you know, I'm a social psychologist by training. And so one of the key things we learn is that we're always engaging in social comparisons throughout our lives, looking at other people and making inferences and judgments about how we feel about ourselves based on what's going on with others. And we need to, you know, recognize that that is a tendency and it can be hard to fight against it, but it's part of the reason why so many of us are dissatisfied with our sex lives and relationships is because we're making poor comparisons. And so, you know, part of it could be maybe we need to adjust the comparison level, um, you know, that we're using. And, you know, for example, instead of looking at sexual qua quantity, you know, how often are you having sex is this key thing we're comparing ourselves on. Maybe it's sexual quality, you know, so how satisfied are you with finding healthy ways to think about your sex life? God, yeah, great advice. Dr. Leigh Miller, thank you so much. This was an amazing episode. You taught me so many new things and I'm sure that my audience gained a lot of insight as well. Can you tell us where people can find you online? 
Sure. So I run a blog and podcast called Sex and Psychology, which you can find at sexandpsychology.com. You can also subscribe to the pod, subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. And you can follow me on all the social media channels. You can find links to those on my websites and on my website and also find links to my books if you want to learn more about the science of sexual fantasies or maybe even get your hands on my textbook, The Psychology of Human Sexuality, if you want to like really take a comprehensive look at the world of sex research. Fantastic. And you guys can find me as always at Holly Randall on Instagram and Twitter. Join my Patreon to support this podcast and get access to free bonus content and early interview releases. That's patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for watching. Dr. Lee Miller, thank you again so much for your time. And I will see you all next week. <laughs>